I think that it froze. I'll answer then. My idea of a friend is he's orange and he's covered in fur and he he gives kisses like you wouldn't believe. Mine is small and covered with feathers. <laughs> All right, can you hear me on the side? I'm not sure what oh, happened there on the other is. side. Yep, we can hear you now. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yep. All right, so my other computer kicked me out. I'm not sure why, but anywho, uh, let me try to, can you see the screen that I have in front of you? All right, so yeah. Justin going down. Um, so I heard someone say loyalty was a, a, a character trait of a good friend. What's something else that, that's indicative of having a good friend? Being supportive. Being supportive. Reliable. Reliable. Okay. Loyal. Okay. Any anyone else? A couple of other people just said trustworthy, loyal again. All right, so unfortunately, okay, there we go. All right, so at the top of the list, um, the things that stand out the most uh, are like just being able to follow the golden rule. What does that mean to you guys? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Treat others the way that you want to be treated, yes. And I, I keep sharing, like I learned about the golden rule in preschool and even now as an adult, that's something that I carry through um, all the time. And then, you know, a few of you said uh, loyalty and what does it mean to be loyal? What does loyalty mean to you guys? I feel like loyalty means like always being there for someone or like something, I guess, and never doing the things that they they say they're bad at or stuff like that, stuff that personal stuff that they shared with you and like okay. not revealing anything and keeping it to yourself too. Okay. Anyone else? Not going to be how people bet. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last person. Not going behind people's back. Not going behind people's back. Yeah, okay. And so from my experience, I have seen that people kind of take this thing called loyalty and they take it to a whole nother level, right? And sometimes we can be loyal to the wrong things or the wrong people. And with regards to loyalty, have you ever experienced like being loyal to a person or a thing even that wasn't necessarily loyal to you? Can anybody attest to that? Um, yeah, also um, when they are able to tell you that um, you're, what, what you're doing is wrong, like if you're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. then like, they won't be that good friend to tell you that this is wrong. They won't try to stop you and not just like follow blindly behind you. Okay. Right? Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Any is there anything else on the list that stands out to you guys with regards to being a good friend? Or anything that's not listed on the list. So I, I did a quick survey. And I had some people share with me things that they thought would make up what a good friend is. Because sometimes I think we don't really think about it, right? You just kind of meet people. And I know in my day, we didn't have technology as much as we do now. And so we had to walk up to people and say, hey, how are you? My name is Ebony. You know, 
do you want to go for a bike ride? Do you want to come over and play? But now you guys have access to technology and a lot of friendships are formulated through like social media, uh, liking someone's picture or sending a comment or sending a, a instant message. Um, what are some of the other things that kind of stand out for you all? People are putting stuff in the chat that says good communication. Mm -hmm. We're saying COVID has made it really hard. COVID has hands down made it hard for people to be able to engage, right? And so just being closed in a lot of times, and one of the things that I always tell people about COVID and being in this pandemic is that it's important to get out of your house so that you can get some vitamin D. We naturally get vitamin D from the sun. Um, and so just being able to do that always makes people feel somewhat better, but being able to effectively communicate, right? Sometimes it's okay to pick up the phone and not just send a text message or do a FaceTime call with regards to communication. Because I think too, like some people feel like because there isn't the face-to-face uh, -face contact with, with others that um, the friendships are, are being damaged or they're being hindered in a certain way when that's not necessarily the, the case. It's just that everybody is confined to their own homes. All right. So yeah, and a lot of people I see in the chat now that some people are saying like they don't have a whole ton of friends, but with regards to, to peer relationships, like just the importance of being able to acknowledge and to identify what a good friend is will will carry you throughout life because sometimes again we find ourselves in situations that aren't so good for us. All right, let me go to the next one. And all right, so this one is pretty easy, right? So in your opinion, your honest opinion, what makes a bad friend? Because sometimes too, we it's easier to identify the bad in people than it is to really be like, oh, this is good. And so I didn't create a list for what makes a bad friend, but because I figured you guys would be able to chime in. All right, so being manipulative. The pandemic made me realize how many fake friends I have. And think about it. We're all closed in, right? And so social, social circles have changed, right? Does it necessarily mean that people are fake? Because sometimes too, we don't consider what other people have going on. So when we think about, you guys say ghosting, right? That's what you say, ghosting. We use the term abandonment. And so during the pandemic, a lot of people have felt like people have ghosted me or people have abandoned the friendship that I once thought we had. But people are really dealing with a lot of different things that they don't necessarily know how to work through. And then in turn, they shut down. And so then on this side of things, we're like, they're not responding to my text messages. They're not responding to me. But we have to also consider whether or not they have some other things going on. Um, all right. Bad friends, manipulation. So friends that manipulate you into trying to do things. All right, someone said it's true, it's better to be alone. Is that always the best way? I say not always. Mm -hmm. Okay, not always, but there are times where you wanna be alone, being quick to cut someone off, ghosting if you felt, I missed the end. But do you think that we're impulsive when it comes to cutting people off? Like think about, about your stuff, you know? When someone is considered a bad friend, when someone is considered toxic, what is it about them that makes them that way, right? I, I'm a very avid believer that people aren't just bad. Most people act out because of things that they've experienced or things that have happened to them, but people aren't just bad. And so it's like, right, no friend is perfect. But so when you seek to gain a certain level of understanding with a friend or someone that you considered a friend at one point, you know, I think sometimes it's really important to ask another question. Like what's really going on with you? Is there anything that you want to talk about, right? Before you go into just cutting people off. But sometimes we cut people off as a way to protect ourselves. Can anyone attest to that? Yeah. All right. You want to share a little bit about it? Are you comfortable with that? 
a time where you had to cut someone off to protect yourself, to protect yourself for your own energy. No, I don't think I've ever done it to protect myself. Okay. I don't do that. <laughs> you said you don't do that? No, I don't. I'm the type of person who puts other people's knees and wants it in front of my own. All right. That's not a good character trait. Not all the time, right? And and it doesn't make you selfish to put yourself first. Because if something is no longer serving you, you have a right to step away from it. You don't have to stay in something that, that doesn't feel good, that doesn't set well with you, um, or that's toxic. I, I see a lot of young people use that word today. When you guys think of toxic relationships, what does that really consist of? Violence. Okay. So are we talking about when a relationship goes sour or south, right? Um, and the violence kind of kicks up in it. At what point do you get so frustrated that you feel like you have to use your hands? Okay. So when we, so for me, listen, I, I don't know about you guys, but when it comes to toxic relationships, violence, like I am real big on the fact that violence is never the answer. You know, um, anytime you're in any relationship, situationship, friendship, and it resorts to play fighting, real fighting, all of that stuff should be off of the table because it always goes to the next level. Um, and and I, can, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'm wearing a t-shirt today that says justice for Tanasia. And it was something along those lines, like friendships going bad and, and just not really paying attention to the red flags of people who are not good for you, right? And so with regards to bad relationships and toxic energy, as you're each and each and every one of you as your own individuals, you have a right to step away and to say, you know what, I don't have to argue with this person. I don't have to really justify why I feel that this individual is a bad friend to me. It's just not serving me. And you move away from it. And a lot of times I know that this is one thing you all can really kind of attest to or you have experienced is that when you have certain adults around you that say so-and-so is no good for you when you have a parent that says uh oh, something about that person i don't really like them hanging around with you or i don't like you hanging around with them why is it that we don't listen when we're young um because we're ignorant and hard-headed ignorant and hard-headed okay that's a good way of putting it. Oh, and because some sometimes kids, when they're young, they're um finding their independence, so they don't really like it when uh, like people help them. They want to like know everything. They want to do things themselves, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So that's good, and I'm glad that you, as an eighth grader, were able to identify the fact that sometimes we can be hard headed. Sometimes we think we know everything, right? We doubt, we don't see the possibilities. And that's true too. Sometimes when you're in a situation, you don't see what other people see, but it is important that you listen to some of the advice that your elders, that your older siblings, that people are, are giving you. I'm a parent. I missed that one. I'm a parent. Honestly, it happens with us as adults too. Hands down, it definitely does. But because we think we're grown and we want to make our own decisions, and that's the part, right? And I, I think that at any age, other people can see through things that you can't see when you're actually in it. But it is important. So when we look at that list of, of what makes a good friend, right, your friend is going to support you. Your friend is going to steer you down the right path. And your friend should never do anything that's going to create harm to you. Hence, your parents are not going to put you in harm's way, right? Your parents are going to steer you 
down the correct path. Your teachers, their job is not to put you in harm's way. So if they see that you're acting a certain way or you're not being the person that they know you to be and they speak to that thing, sometimes it's important that you kind of sit with it and you reflect on it before you just impulsively make a decision, right? And and a lot of times when it comes to bad relationships or bad situations, when something happens and we feel betrayed, you know, we kind of think back to the conversation we had with our parent or with another person that is really in our corner. And it's almost like, you know what, Miss Ebony told me that this was going to happen or, or Mr. Falk said that this was going to happen, you know. And so it's important that, right, your friends will call you out, hands down. People that care and love for you, they will call you out when you're not being your best self. All right. Anything else you guys want to drop in about bad friendships or what what makes a bad friend? And we don't listen. Yep. Um, when they try to convince you to do something that you don't want to do. So when a friend, there, look at you. You're already on to my next slide. Uh, but yes, and so, and that's just it, right? A good friend is not going to encourage you to do something that you have no business doing. And I always tell people too, like anytime you find yourself in a situation where people are encouraging you to do something that would bring shame to yourself or to your family, nine times out of 10, you should not be doing it, right? Because we have spidey senses. That's what I call it. We have spidey senses. We have our gut instincts. We have those butterflies that bubble up into our, our stomachs when we're about to do something that we probably will regret later on down the line. And most times if we fight against those feelings that we are having, we do find ourselves in a situation where we are operating from regret. Um, and so with regards to peer pressure, I selected this particular picture because I wanted it to show you guys how important it is to be your own individual person, right? And so just because a majority of the group is doing something, if it doesn't fall in line with who you are, where you are, what you come from and where you're headed, then you don't have to go with it. It's okay to be different. It's okay to navigate and be a part of different peer groups. Think about it. Sometimes we don't, um, that's true. Sometimes we think that we have to be confined to one particular group. I tell my children, it's a blessing to be able to navigate through multiple groups because in each group, you're going to find a little piece of yourself and a little bit where you can learn from other people. But if you confine yourself to one particular group, and let's say you're in a group that doesn't serve you well, or a group that has more negativity brewing in it than positivity, and they're not necessarily motivating you to operate in your best uh, self, then you lose out. Not the whole group, but you lose out as an individual. And so in the last group, we talked about how there are um, times where peer pressure is a good thing. Can you guys think of like any forms of good peer pressure? When they want you to like stand up for yourself even though you don't want to. Okay, study group, standing up for yourself. Absolutely. Why is it important for us to stand up for ourselves? So in, our, in my world, I call it self-advocacy, right? Because if you if you speak up for yourself, if you stand up for yourself, then a lot of times you you gain a certain level of respect with that, right? Because then people are going to know, well, she has an opinion. He can think for himself. People will not walk over you. Exactly. And you yourself, hands down, are your absolute best advocate. And so while it helps to stop bullying. Yes. And so when, when, when your friends encourage you to stand up for yourself, you know, or they see other people doing things that they shouldn't do and they kind of swoop in to say, Hey, listen, not that one. We're not going to do that. It also shows the bullies that things of that nature are unacceptable. Right. And the other thing is typically when things like that are happening, the other people don't really feel good about themselves. Have you all experienced that? Can't spend another seven or eight years playing and say if I want to begin to fight. Well, again, like I stated, fighting is never the option, right? And so if you're in a group and you feel that 
you know, it's getting to the point where you want to become physical. First of all, nobody should have that amount of power over you. And it's like, oh, well, they caused me to want to fight. No, you made a decision to fight. And then when the consequences are handed over to you, those are your consequences and your consequences alone. And so anytime you're in a situation where you become so enraged that you want to use your hands, it's important that you have the goal to step away or to remove yourself. It doesn't make you a punk. It doesn't make you soft. It makes you smart, you know, and I know you guys hear adults saying that all the time. Fight with your words, not with your hands. But again, the most courageous people are those that can walk away from a toxic situation and say, you know what, this is not for me. I don't want to be out in the street fighting. I tell young ladies, you're not alley cats. You shouldn't be fighting anyway. I tell young men, you are not animals in the Sahara. You should not be fighting. You know, and so it's like, how can we begin to really use our words instead of our hands when it comes to expressing ourselves, right? That falls in line with being able to communicate. You communicate your needs, you communicate your thoughts and your feelings to other people, um, but it does not have to end in fighting. Words will stick a lot longer than any physical pain. And again, we are humans, we're not equipped to endure physical pain. We shouldn't have to live that way. And I think as eighth graders, and, and especially with you guys transitioning into high school, um, I think that these are important conversations to have, you know, because you're going to have to learn how to navigate through peer pressure. You're going to have to learn what a good friend should should have and and what what warrants someone to be a not so good friend if you find yourself in situations where you're always the brunt of a joke that's not those aren't your friends those aren't your friends and then you have those individuals that will apologize to you in private can anyone share a situation like that where maybe somebody clowned you in front of a group or played you i guess those are the terms that you guys use and then they wanted to make like a a sidebar apology. Has anybody experienced that? I remember it happening. I just don't know what the joke was. Okay. So how did you take to the the uh, the private apology? So it was a public joke. So even if you don't remember, that's oh, I think that's good that you don't. I but accepted it. You did or you didn't? I say that I said it, but you really in didn't. all honesty, I didn't really like you anymore. So because that individual what was the question? Color. have you ever been in a situation where someone did something to you? And I, I use the term joke, but it could be any situation where they tried to put you on blast, they tried to expose you many times. Go ahead. Well, you want me to tell, tell you why? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, they just, I don't know, they just made a joke about me or something. So obviously, I told them, but I didn't tell anybody else. And they um, told everybody, like, that was next to us. And, you know, obviously, I was just laughing with them, but I actually didn't like it. But I didn't say anything for that reason. Okay. And so think about that. You know, you you put me in front of this group and you turn it into a joke and you embarrass me. But for the sake of going along to get along, then now I suppress what it is that I'm feeling so that I don't have to deal with the conflict or the backlash in front of everybody. I don't want to play myself anymore in front of everybody. Right. But then if I have a conversation with you outside of that particular group, and then you apologize to me, does that apology hold as much weight? I know for me, I wouldn't want the, the private apology, right? I would want it in front of the group. Mm -hmm. You would want it in front of the group? Okay. And so even with that, like yeah. if you if you cannot own up or hold yourself accountable for you know, your role that you played in causing me as your supposed friend to feel a certain way, then we don't need to have a sidebar conversation about it either. Um, and that's just the way that I operate. But I do think that it's important that when you find yourself in those particular situations, that you're able to say at some point to 
the friend, hey, listen, I did not like when you, you put me out there in front of everybody, or I shared something with you in secrecy and you exposed it to a group of people. And to me, that's not what a good friend does, you know, and that's where that advocating for yourself comes into place um, as well, because sometimes too, people are just naturally funny, right? So we have these people too, and everything is a joke, but it's always the joke about everybody else. It's never about themselves. And, and so it's like, all right, well, what's really going on with that individual that they feel like they have to constantly, you know, shine or, or put other people on blast. So those are red flags to look for too. And, and that's not a healthy sign of a good friendship. Anybody else have anything about peer pressure? All right. So yeah, so the goal is to not go along to get along, to make sure that you're being true to yourself, that you are adhering to the value system that was was laid for you by your family, you know, the people that love you. Um, and, it, and it can be it can be very tough. But again, you know, you guys have so much access to things that when we were coming up, we didn't have access to. And so it's also important to understand that, you know, what what you see people posting is not always their reality, right? I can take 15 pictures before I post the one. And so you don't see all of that. All you see is the picture that in my mind, I think that I have perfected. And so then you strive to kind of put pressure on yourself to do the very same thing or to live a certain lifestyle that is probably not that individual's uh, reality. So again, it's just important to be super true and honest with yourself with regards to your role in friendships as well. It's important to reciprocate or to have that back and forth. Um, you know, you put out good, you get good. Sometimes we, we don't always get good back, but if I'm being true to myself and I'm operating from a genuine position, then all the other stuff doesn't really matter because the good stuff will find its way to me, you know? And then also understanding that negative energy sometimes just comes with the flow of things, but it's up to you to determine and to decide, what am I going to do with this, right? What am I going to do with this negative energy that has been brought my way? Am I going to rise above it or am I going to stoop low and kind of match the energy that's being projected? Um, and so the next one is I want you guys to think about when it gets to the point where you have to end a relationship, right? Because that, that happens, you know, sometimes we outgrow people. Sometimes people are just super toxic, um, and they're no longer serving a purpose in our lives, but understanding that that too is okay. So can anybody share about a time where either someone unfriended them or they had to unfriend another individual? And you could just jump right in. Really, I unfriend... I unfriend a lot of people on Discord. You, you, usually once they start saying some weird crap, then no, block, move on. Okay. And so, so think about it. People. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so a couple of people are saying they unfriended a lot of people. So when we think about unfriended, I just think it's amazing how you guys went to um, like, the social media platforms, right? I'll block you, right? But what happens in real life situations when you unfriend a person, right? Because I can unblock you on social media and especially now during the pandemic, right? I'm not really in front of anybody. So it's easier to unfriend people there. But then what happens next year when everybody's back in school and you're like, you know what? We we just kind of outgrew each other or or things are different now. Like, how do you work through that? I don't know. I have never experienced it. I try to avoid it as much as I can because that's confrontation. I don't like confrontation. I just try to avoid them as best as I can. Okay. Just slowly drift apart. Worked before, it could probably work again. Okay. So is avoidance the best way to go about it? For so me, no. Is that the logical solution? You should probably 
deal with it, talk it out, and then explain because then you can make that person upset. But in my view, in my illogical view, and the view that's best for me is to avoid them. So, all right, so I want you to work on that, Miss Madison. Avoidance isn't the best way to go about things, right? And it, and it does take a lot of courage to to end a relationship. But I think sometimes it's important that we share, like you know, we're just in a different space, you know. And you, I know that you've seen in movies where. People are always like, it's not you, it's me. And sometimes it's not you, right? And just being okay with that. And if a person no longer wants to be friends with you, that is okay too, right? And and the we talked about betrayal and and you know, just how sometimes you're a friend to a person and they're not a friend to you. But when it gets to that point where things are completely different and you make that conscious decision to say, you know what? I, I'm over this relationship. I'm over this friendship. It's okay. You know, we don't always need an explanation as to why we no longer want to be a friend with somebody. And I think that's the most powerful thing we can all walk in when accepting that is just being okay with it. Like, it's okay. You know, if it gets to the point where it's really heavy for you and, and you're struggling, talk to the adults around you, talk to some other people around you. But the pain, the disconnect, any of those emotions that you feel, it will pass, you know? And I, I'm pretty sure all of the adults in this room can think of a time or two where either they had to unfriend someone or someone made a decision to no longer be friends with them. And again, it's okay. And you will turn out to be just fine and you will gravitate towards some new friends, you know, and just being open to the possibilities. Um, Think about unfriending people who maybe family members, again, have already said to you, like, that person's not good for you. I, I don't see that relationship going anywhere. And then it happens. How do you work through it? All right, guys, I know it's the end of the day and, you know, Listen, right now, the, the fifth graders are outshining the eighth graders. Girls, bring it back a notch. So the question was, when you get to a point or you have to unfriend someone or you sit back and you think about, okay, now we're at this point where we're no longer going to be friends or I'm making a decision to, to step away, do you reflect on the times where those adults or other people around you have said that's not a good person for you or maybe you shouldn't be hanging out with that individual? I try not to because that, that, that's, that's going to give me the, the those you were wrong, they were right vibes. And I don't like those vibes. So I try to not reflect and I just try to move on. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, Madison. Okay. So only friendships were only torn due to the global effects. Okay. So yeah, I do think that it has been a challenge for friends to show up the way that they normally would during this pandemic again. Um, but again, a lot of people are struggling and dealing with a lot of things. And I, I, I would like to stand firm on the fact that once you guys move back into um, being in the building, that you'll be able to reestablish or rehash some friendships that maybe kind of dwindled away during the pandemic. So I would like to encourage all of you to just be open to that because it's it's different when you're at home all day, you're home with your siblings. Like we don't know what people are dealing with when they're at home versus you get to check out of home and be at school in your comfort zone with your friends. It, it's just different. So I would encourage all of you to be open to the possibilities of reestablishing some of those relationships that a lot of you have put in the chats have kind of dwindled away due to, to being home and not being in school um, regularly. Um, another person put in the chat that one time their mom noticed that a friendship wasn't good 
And, and you know, I, I can honestly say I, I've been there with my kids. I've been there with my mother. But it's one of those things sometimes we feel like, well, I need to see it for myself. Right. And then you see it for yourself and then you do in your head. So although Madison shared that she doesn't uh, Madison shared that she doesn't reflect, reflecting on things is really, really good. And so the chat is moving really fast. So there was something that said a few students and then I didn't get to read the rest. So can somebody share that with me? I was just saying a, a few of my students have shared that they're kind of nervous about coming back into school, um, mm -hmm. that they're not really comfortable socializing like they used to. They're kind of not sure if that's what they want anymore because they've been home for so long. And I know my own, my older son is in eighth grade and he kind of had the same thing. He went back a couple of weeks ago and it turned out to be a good thing for him, but he was so anxious about it and kind of like, no, never mind. I don't want to go in. So I know a lot of kids are kind of at that point. Right a lot now. of kids are. That's an awesome point. A lot of kids are at that point. Um, but I think that it's important that we continue to give them the platforms to talk it out, you know, to process it. I do believe that, and this is just me with my, my therapist hat on, I do believe that as we begin to transition, that it will be super overwhelming to just throw them all back in at the same time. So I think that how most schools do it, like the stagger um, re-entry, I guess, for lack of a better term, but just kind of maybe breaking it down into smaller segments where maybe the the fifth graders go back and then the sixth graders go back you know and then kind of incorporating like smaller events even where the kids can get together and socialize especially with some of the um the restrictions being lifted you know but but also practicing safety and and this pandemic has just caused everybody to shift and and where some kids we were concerned that they were going to have a difficult time they actually loved being separated right and being at home and just being in the comforts of their their own spaces but i think that it's super important that we continue to talk about all of the the anxiousness that goes along with returning and that's the thing right like that's a good point mason um like with anything, right? We're always nervous in the beginning until we actually get out there and do it. Think about the first time you you got into a swimming pool, let's say if you couldn't swim at all and you weren't exposed to water, but then you got in and you're taking these lessons and then by the end of that, that, that training season, you're good at it. It's the same with any other sport, right? I might not be the best at it, but I'm nervous about joining this new team. I'm going to be the new kid, right? And so the one good thing about the pandemic is that everybody has been out, right? And so everybody's coming back at the same time. So that also lets us know that no one is alone in this transition. Um, okay. But yeah. So I think our students, um, our eighth grade is in, in this district. It's, it's a unique situation because there's actually three middle schools and okay. high school, they all come together. So for some of them, they've all been together since they, they've gone from elementary through middle and now they get to high school. And we have probably a hundred and between 150 to 200 eighth graders that they're going to meet up with 400 more eighth grade or eighth graders than ninth graders when they get to high school. Some of them they may know because they can, you know, they're, they're coming out of, you know, the same neighborhoods. And then a lot of them, they don't know. And that for some of them is where a lot of that anxiety is coming in because this year has been so uniquely different for them. And it's not as if they're coming back to what's familiar to them, to our building, to the teachers they know, but they're gonna leave us and they're gonna go to the high school and they're gonna have 400 plus new, there's like 2000 kids at the high school, 400 of them are gonna be other ninth graders who they don't know. Um, and they're gonna have to be trying to navigate a new building and because of the way some of their classes are set up, like they're used to, you know, some of our kids have been together in the same class literally for the last four years, but they get to high school and it won't be that. Yeah. And, and those are the conversations that are important, right? And so I'm pretty sure um, just being able to, to put them in positions where, because again, like you said, it's, it's going to be different. So we have to be creative, um, setting up, 
times where they can, you know, connect with one another. Um, I think that these virtual meetings are great to kind of be able to put faces with names, but I would love to encourage each of you, you know, to just be open to the possibilities. Don't feel like you're confined to the group that you know. Be open to meeting people from other groups because again, you you never know. You might establish a lifetime, a lifelong friendship um, in that manner. Um, and we've all been there. And so we can attest to what you guys are feeling with regards to that transition. But I think the biggest takeaway that I can encourage you or leave you guys with, with regards to peer relationships is being open to interacting with people that are different from you, being open to interacting with people who come from different sides of town. You know, we don't have to fall into this whole idea of turf or because I'm from here, I have to stay with this group or because I'm from here, I have to stay with this group. When I was your age, I got along with everybody, you know, so I was free to go wherever I wanted to go. And every time, even to this day, when I'm out, people are like, oh, Ebony, I remember you. Hey, Ebony. And my kids are looking at me like, mom, you know, everybody. But it's because I never operated in a position of just being closed minded and not being willing to establish friendships with people who were different from me. Um, and so I, I would encourage you guys to really tap into that. But um, again, the whole the whole concept of unfriended is is knowing when it's time to step away, knowing when a relationship, a situation, a friendship is no longer serving you, being able to identify what warrants a person to be considered a friend, a good friend at that, because it's a privilege to be your friend. It's a privilege to be my friend. And I think if we can start operating from that stance and ultimately treating people the way that we would like to be treated, I think that it eliminates a lot of the toxic traits that you guys talked about. I think that it eliminates um, being able to gossip and, and the need to talk behind people's backs. A lot of times when that type of stuff is happening, again, it doesn't speak to your character, but the character of the other person. And lastly, you know, when a person shows you who they are, you have to believe them, right? Because we can wear a mask, but for so long. And if a person has more bad tendencies or not so good friend traits, than good ones, then most times they're not going to be able to, to keep that mask on and it will fall apart and they'll burst at the seams. But it doesn't mean that they're a bad person all around. It just means that they're not a good fit for you and being okay with that. Yeah, I often so, talk to the students, um, Ms. Madry, about their inner circle and mm -hmm. that you need to be able to distinguish who is your inner circle, who are those people that you will tell your deepest, darkest secrets to, and who are the people that are just, you know, I might see you from time to time, I might hang out with you from time to time, I will always say hi and bye to you in the hallway, but they're not your inner circle. You know, it, I guess in terms of who, who would be standing beside you at your wedding, who would be, you know, your person, your person. I hate to say like that Grey's Anatomy an analogy, but who is your person? Yeah. Um, and everybody can't be your person. So you really, in your mind, have to, you have to come up with a list of what traits you are looking for in a good friend. Who will make a good friend that would fit to be in your inner circle versus who are your, going to be your social people that are your high and by? Maybe we, we all go do something together every now and then but you're not who I talk to on the phone, you know, every single day. You're not who, when I'm in the, the darkest hour of my life, you're not the person I'm going to call to have those con intimate conversations with um, when I'm, I'm at my worst. Um, and, and that's something that kind of comes as you start to grow more into who mm -hmm. you will be as young adults. And then as you get older and, and it is, it, it will change. It will change. You will not always hold on to your friends from middle school. I do. I had my friends from them, but we were a very tight and close knit group. But then when I got to college, I had another group and I've been able to merge my groups. Um, and so we all, but it doesn't all work that way. And there have been times when in my adult life, I've, I've had to say, you know what? You don't fit my circle anymore. Mm -hmm. I still love yeah. you, but sometimes you have to love people. I have a 
And that goes to the boundaries that uh, Mr. Fox was talking about. Um, it, it is important to have boundaries with both friends and family, you know, um, and just being able, again, to know what really serves you. Yes, Nicholas, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've been, some of you already know that I've been doing this YouTube thing where I talk to kids that went to the high school. And um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a link in the chat, like and subscribe. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the kids that I interview are saying that they're the biggest, um, the biggest change going from middle school to high school is just merging with all of those other middle schools at the high. But the kids that really make those lifelong friendships are the kids that get involved and start mm -hmm. meeting people like Dr. Hampton said, outside their inner circle. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we are in our little, and I know the last year has been crazy. So obviously it's different, but while at Stewart, we're in our own little building. And then all of a sudden we get to a much bigger building that where there's four times more kids, mm -hmm. young adults. So, um, you know, one of the things that I am plugging my YouTube, that's right. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I, that I always hear from like these uh, students or former students of mine that I talk to is the importance of getting involved, whether it's a club or a program or just finding a way to meet new people. Because you may not have a lot of people that you're in common with now, but soon you will find all these different people from all these different places Mm -hmm. And you will know, like, you, you might have somebody that's just like you, you just never met them yet. So and, that's, to... and that's the reality of life, right? And, and as you guys go through high school, go through college, you begin working, you know, you are going to be exposed to so much more than what's right in front of you. Um, and in and, and life, it is. It's all about decision making, you know, and you deciding how involved do you want to be? How open do you want to be? Um, and that's the power of being able to choose. So um, do you guys have any questions for me? And I'm going to subscribe to your page, uh, your YouTube channel. Good plug. <laughs> All right. Any questions? I have a friend that's been my friend since second grade. Okay. And that's awesome. Everybody doesn't have that privilege, right? But just because you guys have been friends since second grade, what if you guys get to the point where you're going to two separate um, colleges or you're working for two different companies and you begin to intertwine with other friends and other groups? I don't want you to think that because you guys have that time under your belt that you have to be close-minded to being able to meet other people. And, and I think Dr. Hampton said it, like she's been able to kind of merge her two groups. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't because sometimes you will have those friends that are like, I was here first and they're territorial and they're like, uh-uh. And then that jealousy kind of bubbles out and spews over. And then you're in a position of feeling like you have to choose between the two. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to choose. All right, any other questions? If not, I would like to say thank you guys so much um, for you know allowing me into your space today, um, allowing me to kind of talk um, and for the engagement. I really appreciate the back and forth. Um, and the other thing, oh, and I want to apologize for my, my computer technical difficulties. I'm like, no, when I get to the eighth graders, we're going to rock out. And then we had to navigate through this. But nonetheless, we got through it. Again, I appreciate you all for your time. It's been my pleasure to, to be able to meet you all. Um, I've been excited leading up to this. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'll forever be grateful. Um, Dr. Hampton has my contact information. If questions come up for you guys later, by all means, you know, you guys can put them together, shoot me an email, or at some point I can come back in and speak with you all. Um, and I just want to wish you all well um, as you continue to use your voices and you continue to advocate for the things that you guys need um, in the eighth grade. And I think that you guys will all do phenomenally as you move into high school.
Ms. Mandry, thank you so much for blessing us with a word today. Um, today has been phenomenal so far. We are, are, you guys have made it through four sessions of developing who you are. I promise you today will be all about you and what you needed to be better individuals. Um, the, uh, just the honesty and openness that I mm -hmm. saw and the way you all leaned in and were willing to just um, share for some of you, I mean, some of you were sharing things that I know it was not easy for you to let go of, but I love that we were able to create a space for you to feel comfortable enough that you could lean in today. Um, we have one more. We have our wrap up and our closing um, from Mr. Pender, who is going to wrap us up for the day and send us out floating on cloud nine. And then our staff has a wonderful message. So we leave them feeling empowered at two o'clock. As soon as Mr. Pender is done his closing um, address to all of the students at Stewart, you guys are going to get a Google form for you to fill out. It does not take you very long. It is just for you to give us feedback so that we can see how you felt about today, what you liked, what you didn't like. Would you like to see something like this again? Um, and for, I know for my students, that is what I'm using to see who am I giving extra credit points to today. So if you don't complete it, I don't know that you stayed throughout the day. And if you do, so your teacher, your homeroom teachers will push that out to you for you to complete the Google form. 2 to 3 p.m. is your async time. So you will be able to complete your form. If there were any other assignments or anything you really kind of wanted to work on today, you were able to do that as well um, during async time between 2 and 3. So we have about five minutes have about five minutes before you are going to get a live streaming link to see our closing address from Mr. Pender. And then after that, you will get the Google form to complete. And we will have wrapped up our first student development day. And I thank you all so much for hanging Dr. in. Hampton, Dr. Hampton, Dr. Hampton, thank you for setting this up and uh, Stuco as well for getting involved. Uh, I, I loved every second of today. So Great job, you. Dr. Hampton. Same thing. Uh, kudos to the student council as well. Great job. Awesome day today, guys. Yes, and our students have been phenomenal today. You guys, I, I was hoping this, I've never seen so many cameras on at one time. You guys were going in the chat, being positive with each other. Um, it was so nice just to be able to see all of you. I think for some of you, this is the first time you've been able to cross see some of the classes and interact with some of your peers who are in other classes. So I, I thank you and I thank you teachers for supporting this day and giving up your time today to help us make it together. But this was not me, this was this was student council. This was their idea. They had, it was laid on their heart and they wanted the building to have something to help start to bring them together as we get ready to come back into the building. And I, I think we will come back better than how we left last year. Uh, and I'm looking in the chat. Matry said it really is worth it. Today was good and awesome. Thank you, guys. I, I, it is appreciated. Student Council, we are excited to hear your feedback about today. And if it works, like they, they're like, we love to do this every year. They want, they're talking about, can we do this with the other middle schools so we can start to close up um, some of what Mr. Parrish was saying. How we don't They know don't copy us. us. Uh, it's not a competition. We started it, though. Exactly okay. what Julie said. Do we send out yep. the live stream next to them? Is that, is that the deal? Yes, that is the deal. Next is the one you put in, Parrish, in the chat. Yes, it's the same live stream. It's actually the same live stream from this morning. So actually, let me get over and open. I need to open up that Google Meet for them. So I am about to close out this eighth grade meet. We have our closing remarks from Mr. Pender. Thank you all, coworkers. I will see you on the other side for the amazing word that you guys are going to get this afternoon. What's the code for that? What? Uh, and Jury, we miss you. Come back. Come back and visit us. Please. You I, was, a I was in Norristown on Friday and Saturday. Aw. You had to go back. And you didn't tell us. Yeah. Okay, I mean, Jury. I completely forgot, so. Not so bestie vibes, Jory. <laughs> 
uh, got another guest. You know, it's not my you. fault. Yeah, you know, we miss you. So well, you you now have the end. So you know you keep coming to our student council meetings and hanging in because jury was a huge huge brain behind a lot of what happened today. Like she came back from the other and was like, we need to do this at Stewart. And it just so happened that she moved halfway through. But as you can see, she still hung in here with us and wants to continue to be a part of our Stewart family. And we welcome her. She's a welcome, always come back. No, Alyssa, you're getting ready to get a live stream pushed out to you <laughs> so you can catch the closing remarks. All right, so with that being said, Adios. I will see you guys on the other side. Zamir is posting his stuff in the chat. If anybody want to talk, Zamir is looking to make some new friends, which I think is awesome. Wait, we have to leave? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys have to go. Through. You got to get to the last, the last, the last, last session today, which is the closing remarks. It starts in like five, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes it starts. Three minutes. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Give you guys a chance to all say bye to each other. Y'all have to Bye. invite me into your classes so I can come with AC. Bye. Bye. Hold on, I'm still recording.